All right. Let's get started, everybody. Um, my name is Scott Brooks. I am a partner and vice president with Org Vitality. This is the final session of our uh, virtual conference yesterday and today. And uh, delighted to get started. We got an exciting panel uh, coming up. Uh, and there are just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, number one, uh, after the conclusion of this session, there'll be a tiny little survey. Uh, we are a survey company, so please take the time to answer that about this session. Uh, number two, at the conclusion of this uh, session in an hour, we're going to uh, all, if we can, linger a little bit, uh, have other people come on video, have uh, people come off mute to have a little bit of a virtual gathering, uh, sort of like coming up to the panel after the uh, a real conference session just to sort of chat a little bit, uh, grab a beverage if you want. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, if, if it works for you, if not, uh, no worries. Also, this session will be recorded and uh, recordings and, and other conference materials will be available uh, next week. So with that, I'm pleased to kick this session off. Uh, this is crafting the executive message in today's uh, survey results. We have a great panel with us today, uh, and let me introduce them briefly. Uh, Michael Lueck is head of people analytics at Qualcomm, um, which includes uh, survey dashboards, advanced analysis, program evaluations, company-wide surveys. And uh, Mike and his team take a holistic approach to measurement that drives actions across HR and, and all the business. Um, so they deal with issues like you might expect related to wellness, diversity, leader effectiveness, and engagement. Uh, next, we have Tommy Powell, the head of People Surveys and Measures at GlaxoSmithKline. If you hear us say GSK, that's the, the very same place. Um, Tommy leads design, development, and implementation of large-scale surveys and, and organization assessment efforts. Um, and he also acts as the uh, subject matter expert, one of them, uh, certainly in the realm of organizational team, individual level measurements like uh, surveys, team diagnostics, 360s, upward feedback, and so forth. And then um, third on the list, alphabetically, we've got Zoe Schweitzer. She's the chief people officer at Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams. She leads uh, HR, uh, including organizational development, environmental health and safety um, at Jenny's and, and everything having to do with, with managing uh, people and, and the people processes. I'm thrilled to uh, be on this panel with these three people. I've known each of them in different capacity for years, um, whether it's through survey consortia or different kinds of work, or even in, uh, gosh, uh, some for more than 20 years. So it's been quite a while, and um, I'm, I'm very excited for this session. What the pattern of the session will be is I'm going to give each panelist a, a slide to sort of give a little bit of grounding and context about some of their come froms about this topic. And then we're going to open it up for discussions and I'll moderate with questions for each ones. And, and if uh, any of you in the audience have questions you want to toss in at any point, uh, feel free and we can, we can play from there. Um, I will be monitoring the, the Q and a panel. So, um, with that, let's get started. Uh, so, Mikey, you want to give a little grounding on, on where you are with this kind of topic and some of your, your come from here? That would be great. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for the introduction, for having me be part of the panel today. Great to be with everybody. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to just give a little bit of an overview on the survey program that we have at Qualcomm and how that's held up over this pretty unusual year. Um, I think we kept most of it intact and made some minor adjustments to, to deliver what was needed in, in these times. But yeah, to kick it off with just a, a basic overview of our program, we have a, you know, a robust survey program from company-wide surveys to pulse surveys on samples. And really we, we get things going every two years with the large climate survey initiative that sets the agenda for the next couple of years. So leaders, uh, take all the data we provide there, commit to a series of actions at the company, division level, and all of that. And then over the next two years, we measure the progress that we're making there. So that's through these um, pulse surveys that go out to a sample of the company to see, you know, how are we doing in the areas we want to make progress, tie it back to programs and, and things that we're doing, and share updates very frequently with our employees. 
Uh, in addition, on the poll surveys, we have a unique focus area every quarter. So just understanding what leaders care about, what's topical, what do we need to dive into to give more context. And this is what we were doing like any other year, just carrying on. And then in March, um, you know, as COVID hit, it was announced a global pandemic. We sent everybody home. You know, the we needed to revisit some things basically. So we had a survey open at the time. We let that ride out without adding any additional questions. Although we did have a couple things on that survey we were able to look at to have some really quick insights real time on the impact that it was having on our employees and the way they perceived um, positively that the company was handling it. And so we had some insights right off the bat really, but executives definitely wanted to get deeper into understanding what is it employees need, uh, what's going well or not so well, do they have resources, what else are they looking for and how can we support them? And so we rarely do big surveys outside of this quarterly program, but in this case, it was obviously a time to make an exception. And shortly after we closed our March survey, we did another company-wide survey in April and got the answers there, struck a really good tone with employees, just a very carefully constructed survey. Um, we took action and, and communicated back right away with that and did some really good things. Um, and, and I think scratched the initial itch of what leaders want to know about the situation. Then a couple more months passed and, you know, leader interest started bubbling up again around another survey, this time looking, you know, farther out into the future of work and how that's going to change. So now that employees have tasted working from home, you know, how much do they want to come back to the office? If they did, what do they want to do when they come on site? Uh, understanding would they be willing to use shared workspaces in the future once that's safe to do and things like that. And it was a pretty big topic where they, again, were looking at doing another standalone survey. But in this case, we really worked with them to understand this is just our normal pulse survey program. We should still ask our core items and look at the progress we're making on existing initiatives and other things going on like social injustice while we can get the, the detail on flexible work in the future of work as well. And so that went really well. You know, we got them answers to everything they were looking for on both sides of the core items and the, the focus topic. Um, and I think gained a lot of credibility on just the, the structure of the program being able to adapt to really uh, urgent needs and, and what they needed to know and fold that into existing efforts instead of separate standalone surveys. And so here we are in September now, ready to go forward with our next quarterly pulse survey and, you know, no pushback against our approach there after seeing how well that went last time. And we're, we're kind of back uh, intact, making it through this with pretty, pretty minimal compromises or, or having to flex to get everybody what they need while not, you know, starting from scratch on things. And so we'll, we'll look forward to get into it with more of the discussion today, but at a high level, that's what I wanted to share up front. Mm -hmm. Great. Tommy? Yep, uh, that's, that was interesting, Micah. Um, like, like Qualcomm, we, GSK has a long history with uh, employee surveys. I've been there doing employee surveys with GSK for more than 20 years. Um, so it's a very well-established process. Unlike Qualcomm, I guess our difference is that we have a history of having kind of big set piece annual employee surveys. For a while, we did have them every six months, but they were still, you know, the same. All employees got uh, got the survey at the same time. Um, I guess what I wanted to focus on today was uh, given that foundation that we have, um, what's been different about this time, what, what's sort of the context that was different now. And of course, there's the whole uh, COVID thing with my little whimsical uh, graphic there in the middle. Um, part of our context was we have what I have put here as a newish CEO. She's, she's in her third year now, um, but still feels a bit new. Uh, she had a very strong influence on the survey but we're pushing really hard to a historic split of the company. So we're a, a big pharma company, but we also have 
a very large consumer healthcare component of our business. And we've thought for quite a while, um, and investors have thought for quite a while about splitting the business, and that's uh, now going to happen here, like in the next year and a half or so. We announced it, I guess, about six months ago. So starting from last year, we were already in kind of the the thinking and the working towards what do we need to do, what do we need to understand to get us ready for this historic split of the company. Um, all the while, the CEO is very focused on our strategic initiatives and what are objectives that everybody needs to be focused on, which made its way into our measurement systems. The little graphic you see on the right-hand side of the slide there is just an overview that we're uh, measuring culture related to the CEO's vision at three levels in the organization. Our big organizational survey that we're mostly going to focus on today, uh, a high-performing teams diagnostic that um, has been in play for probably about two years now, and then a kind of standard leader 360. And our second biggest measurement tool is our line manager feedback, kind of upward feedback for managers, which um, gets tied very closely to the uh, employee survey. Um, the other bit of context that I, I think is um, really important is as we were preparing for the survey to go out in May, um, then the whole kind of slide down towards moving, for, working from home happened. And um, we went from slight adjustments to the survey for this plan sp split to very last minute changes that we put into the survey related to, as Mike was saying, the same kind of questions like now that everybody's working from home, what do we need to understand about performance? What do we need to understand about people's perceptions? How do they feel about working from home? And their questions around there got amplified by the fact that we were like working toward this split. So both of the new companies are thinking about, for example, their real estate footprint that they're going to have and policies about, you know, who's going to be in the home office and who's going to be working from home. So they saw this as a real opportunity to almost do a bit of a forced experiment. Everybody is working from home, at least 80, about 86% of the workforce is working from home. So we were using this as an opportunity to see how this is going, both from a, like a real performance perspective, but also a perception and attitudinal perspective. And then the, the last bit of context that may come out in, in the questions today is, is sort of my own context in this. And I'm a IO psychologist by background, but I'm only one of two IO psychologists in a, a pretty large um, people analytics function that's made up mostly of data scientists. So sometimes there's like a, uh, um, a bit of tension that comes into play with the, uh, the, the sort of data science approach to big data and just churning lots of numbers through a machine learning algorithm to say something insightful versus having uh, theories and hypotheses which are driving driving what kind of analyses you do and I, I think some of that came out in um, w will come out in some of the questions today. Cool and Tommy if it helps inspire a little accountability I know the second IO psychologist from GSK is, is on the attendee list so. Yeah and and I yeah. guess <laughs> Scott but just one more bit of context that you've mentioned that I, yeah. I failed to mention here or put on the uh, on the slide is we are a pharma company, right? So as we were sending people to work from home and then um, getting ready to do this survey, uh, our two things that our employees had in their heads, one was they're very thankful that they have the kind of work that allows them to continue to work, right? We see lots of people who were out of work, but our employees weren't. And the other thing that I think played into some of our results is a lot of uh, I'd, I'd say probably increased connection to what we do as a company. And I think that was reflected in some of our scores on our survey that people feel very 
proud of what we're doing. We have, you know, several things that are in play now that will hopefully be able to help in the in the pandemic. So I think that was on people's minds as well. If you want to hand out free samples after the session, um, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and speaking of free samples, uh, Zoe, let's move to you. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Micah. Thanks, Tommy. That was really interesting to hear about your organizations. And I know, Scott, one of your goals was to have differences amongst your three panelists. And I, I feel like I'm going to learn a lot from listening to you because your organizations and situations are very different. At Jenny's, Splendid Ice Creams, we're about a 20-year company, not quite 20 years in existence. Um, we're still founder led Jenny is still around and very involved, which is important in this conversation because we did almost no surveying prior to this year because um, we have a very sort of a scrappy, simple approach to a lot of things. If we want to know how somebody feels in Texas, we get on a plane and go and gather them and talk to them face to face. Our communication methods have to do with, hey, print out my email and put it on every cork board in the back of the scoop shop and in the back of the warehouse and then tell your people to read it. Um, we're 800 people, 50 buildings, 16 cities, which to us is complicated and huge, but I know by many company standards, that's still kind of hometown. Um, so we, like I said, we are simple, small and scrappy and very founder led and CEO led. And so things like, you know, people would ask me, you know, do you do focus groups to figure out what ice cream flavors you're going to make? And we would kind of smile and say, we have a focus group of one, you know, Jenny is the one who tells us what, what's going to be made today. And we, we get to sample and certainly always offer opinions, but um, she's a very strong force in our company. And because of all those norms in our organization, we just traveled a lot, talked a lot, uh, that kind of thing. So all of a sudden, um, uh, overnight, it seemed uh, we could, most of us could no longer be together, at least not the home office. Um, our pint demand, as you can imagine, you can make your ice cream, but you have to put it in the right container. So your pints are going, we have three ways of selling our ice creams. We sell our ice creams in grocery stores and hotels and places like that where someone is selling it on our behalf. We sell our ice cream through our e-commerce website, which means you go on jennys.com, you say, I want these four pints, we pack it in dry ice and we ship it and there's a orange box that shows up on your doorstep two days later with dry ice in it with your pints. And then we have scoop shops where you walk into a scoop shop and we have ambassadors, uh, ice cream ambassadors that scoop your ice cream for you and hand it to you over the dipping cabinet. Well, a lot of our, what we call buckets are what are in the dipping cabinet and you scoop out of that and you hand you the cone all of a sudden COVID hit and we had to close down all the operations that include customer contact or sampling or scooping ice cream and handing it to you. But we could sell pints in our scoop shops. We could sell our pints through e-commerce and we could sell our pints in the grocery stores. And as we all know, um, grocery store sales changed dramatically. Pint sales went through the roof in the grocery stores. All of a sudden, tons of people who'd never gotten online and ordered pints of Jenny's through the internet were doing so. And no one could take ice cream out of a bucket. So uh, everything had to change in terms of our, um, uh, the way we uh, source and package and ship and, and all the things having to do with getting it in the right kind of container for the demand. So lots of changes there. Um, we experienced a group of our employees who are mostly public facing, about 600 out of our 800 folks are people who are scooping ice cream for the public and all of a sudden there's so much stress around if I wanna work, I have to be in a scoop shop and what's gonna be the operational norm today because I have to figure out whether we can be open or closed or get pints out the door or not get pints out the door, can I scoop? So things were changing rapidly, especially in the beginning. Um, so lots of operational changes, so many decisions needing to get made, especially through virtual collaboration, which we didn't have um, the muscles built for that, like a lot of organizations that have to work virtually a lot anyway. We certainly had and were doing some of that, but all of a sudden it was only virtual collaboration. And we were furloughing and unfurloughing because our scoop shop operations were demanding that we were open and then closed and then at different levels of operating where uh, we might need two people only for many weeks at a time and then all of a sudden some change happens where we can open our doors back up to the public and all of a sudden we're trying to hire back up for those operational changes. So, so many things in flux, so many disruptions. Um, 
our, our kitchen, we have an eight person kitchen and all of a sudden the kitchen was working in the warehouse and lots of movement. So uh, I would also mention some of the other changes that sort of happened after that initial set of changes being that uh, we were ongoing trying to monitor every city because every city was different. I was shocked at how different every city was experiencing COVID and their government mandates were so different by city. And our employee population had different preferences by city. One city would say, I can't believe you're you know, gonna close because we wanna work and we wanna be open. And the next city would say, I can't believe you're gonna be open. We think you should close. So it was uh, interesting to take in all those different opinions. Um, we had uh, mandates that our customers wear masks, but some didn't want to. And some of our employees wanted to be able to turn away service and lots of decisions to make around how we could handle protocols like that. As we all know, this political environment is quite interesting. So that was having an impact on our, our teams, our cities, our communities that we're in. This racial justice awakening is having an impact on our team. And I, I will say our company is built on uh, sort of Jenny's track record of uh, kind of a history of activism and it was related to gender equity and LGBTQ plus equity. Um, so we had a interesting infrastructure built for this sort of thing, but a very new um, awakening opportunity and, and a lot of, again, disruption to say, well, how do we take what we've been doing that's working, but apply it to sort of a new realm um, and make sure our employees know we're responding to an opportunity. And then the disparate impact of COVID depending upon your position. So what I mean by that is, you know, you're uh, looking at me right now and I'm in my office at, in the home office because I want to be. If I wanted to be at the warehouse and talking to you from there, I can. Or if I wanna be in my home office at my house with my kids doing their homework on the side, I can do that because that's the kind of job I have and I'm very fortunate. It's a very different situation for someone in our kitchen or someone in our warehouse or someone in our scoop shop and so all of a sudden, I can't travel as easily at all to get to see everyone. So many people are impacted so differently. Some roles are public facing, some roles aren't public facing. And so the implication of this was we needed new ways to get out of our own heads and out of our own perspectives and understand what was going on across our company. And we'd never had the kinds of limitations or the kinds of disruptions that this year posed. And so surveys became uh, something we were leaning on and had not previously. So I'll, I'll uh, hope that as we talk about this, I can tell you a little bit more about how some of that was really useful for us. Great, thanks. Um, okay, uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing now and uh, then we're gonna just go more to the, uh, uh, you know, chatting part of this. So obviously it's a different kind of year than it's been before. You've, you've each just outlined some different kinds of, of legacies and histories for um, executive orientations as well as surveys or sensing kinds of approaches. Um, first question is, you know, what, what are people really asking for that's different or driving towards or demanding? And, Tommy, let's start with you. You touched a little bit on the um, the work from home kind of thing, but, but when you stop and think about larger theories that maybe executives are, are trying to chase or espousing, uh, what's what's different now than before? Hmm. I think w one of the questions that, that was different um, was, should we do the survey? <laughs> so, like I said, we have a, a 20 plus year history of, of, you know, doing this survey and it being a really important part of how we do business. And as this stuff was kind of going down, that became a real question. Like, is this the right thing to do? At the time, Italy and the UK were really suffering. And we decided that, um, that yeah, it was the right thing to do, that it was best to, especially as we are sending people home, to stay connected with people and, and give them a way to still, other than their manager, to still connect with the company. Um, I, I think beyond that, what was different is I, I felt like there was a, a much more genuine interest in how people were really feeling and not just big aggregate numbers like splashing up, how's this business doing and that business doing, but really 
wanting to understand how um, individual employees were feeling about things. And one way that that um, kind of showed itself was uh, typically we get the survey results back, we do some fancy analyses, we go sort of present our theories and cool um, graphics and things back to the executives and then they start talking about it and um, they start asking their questions. This time we were going down that path but sort of the reverse happened where they came to us and said we've got these hypotheses about how people are feeling in the company. Um, things like people feel more connected to the company's mission. The work feels like it's being more frontline led. People feel like they're um, focused more, they're able to focus more on priorities. Some of those hypotheses I think were borne out by the data and some of them didn't get as much support. But the really cool thing was, and the thing was different, is they came to us and they said, these are our hypotheses. Can you use this survey data to help us test whether these things seem to be true or not? Let me pause on that one for a second. Uh, so, Micah, in terms of like hypotheses that executives seem to have, uh, have you been feeling that? Can you give an example? Uh, Zoe, maybe you start with you. Yeah, I would agree that there's uh, one of the silver linings of what has happened is, you know, I, th I guess, let me say it differently. You know, a lot of executives get paid to be certain about things and they feel like that's what they bring in terms of value. And this last year, I think everybody left their certainty at the door and just sort of said, I don't know, there's not a playbook for this and there's no single role that's responsible for COVID response or we're, we're all in this together. So there was a different level of openness and curiosity that was kind of, uh, you know, refreshing if you have to find the positive in a lot of really hard things. And so, yes, I would say in our company too, there were a lot of people who were hypothesizing, but what would have happened in a previous year might be that we thought for sure we knew the answer about how this person felt or that team or that geography. And now it was an open-minded curiosity, um, kind of a feel to the situation where we'd say, well, we think this, but we can't get on a plane right now to go find out. We can't even convene in a herd in some scoop shop anyway. And so let's do a survey so that we can test whether or not we have any idea what we're talking about. And the other thing, I'd, other word I guess I'd bring into it is sort of a humility. Um, I think this situation has humbled a lot of us because what got you to this point in your career is not something necessarily that teaches you what to do under these circumstances. So I think the humility made folks really realize that we don't know what we don't know and we better we better be asking because it was it's sort of um, arrogant to think that we have any idea what it's like to be in a very different position in a different geographic region and different kind of job, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I would echo what both of you said for our executives too on just curious minds and being willing to look at things. And for the most part, I mean, the, the data we're reviewing with them were showing very positive trends both on sentiment and how people are doing. And even our productivity metrics are like, vastly higher than they were prior to COVID, which was remarkable. Um, but they, they looked at both sides of the coin of that to say, how sustainable is this for our people? And so that was something that was great to see the, you know, the advocacy for our employees on, it's great, things are going so well, but uh, you know, are people taking good enough care of themselves? It seems like longer days, more meetings and all of that. So what can we do to address that? And just broadly, for the culture, uh, wondering how we can maintain that over time. So they did have some theories with that, you know, suggesting some of why it's going so well is because we've all known each other for years, worked side by side, face to face. And so now in this virtual environment, it's still easy to tap someone on the shoulder and, and get the help that you need. But could that become more difficult over time is something they're trying to test. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, go oh, sorry, Scott, go ahead, I'll, I'll add after, later. Please. Well, it, just sort of a, a, a theme that you all said, I mean, you all come from very different organizations with different footprints and different operational impact from COVID, but you each, I think, echoed that this was an opportunity to express values, uh, curiosity, humility, um, you know, other things that you care about, the self-care kinds of things, uh, Micah, that you just referenced. And so, um, I find that, that 
interesting um, and maybe uh, something that we all wish our leaders always did, but you know, might not. Anyway, go ahead, Zoe. Uh, the, the thing I was thinking about is, you know, your initial question to Tommy, I think, was what have your executives been asking for that's a little bit different? So I wanted to add into the mix that um, one thing we've been thinking about differently and people have been asking for are opportunities to still feel like we convene, but we're not. And that's very different for us. Um, so as an HR person, I'm, I have a really strong negative reaction when people perceive HR as sort of the party planners and the ones who make people feel good with the soft skills. And because I, while of course we would love people to love their jobs and their paychecks, and I do want people to love their you know, experience as an employee, I don't want to be perceived as party planners. But what I realized about four months into this situation was that someone needed to lead the effort of convening a lot of lonely people. And so the thing that I wanted to bring into this conversation was that one unique thing that was getting asked for was like, well, how can we mimic bumping into each other in the hallway and finding out that someone's dog is sick so we can still be there for each other and those kinds of things. And so we started getting creative and putting something on the calendar every couple of weeks to mimic that, find out how each other was doing, how can we support each other, what's a random act of kindness that we might be able to pull off even during these crazy days. So that was a really unique request that, that uh, I was hearing across the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you each find that um, there's something that you wish your executives asked for, but they didn't? Um, you know, just to build off of what Zoe just said on, you know, this being a different situation for everybody. And yeah, for example, some people struggling with, you know, too many work demands, but some people struggling with isolation and more loneliness and things like that. Um, we have a lot of insights from our surveys, but I would love if we could supplement it more with like organizational network data to ask some of those interesting questions on, on you know, really getting at, uh, are there pockets of isolation? Is inclusion getting better or worse? Are managers more or less responsive now than they were before? Um, are people's days truly longer compared to their normal working hours and things like that? Uh, onboarding in the virtual environment, are people getting up to speed and meeting people as quickly uh, as they were in the traditional environment. So for us, I think that's just one thing. They're probably asking questions that get at all of that, but I just think that would be a useful way of answering some of those or adding context to what we have from, from the survey. I like what you did just there, Micah, which is, is you took sort of the, the spirit and the, the, the sort of direct connection uh, statement that Zoe just made, and you were talking about how to measure that um, and data. Uh, and it's your job, right? Um, <laughs> um, Tommy, you had talked before about uh, hypotheses and maybe some that turned out to be true and not true. Um, do you have any good examples of either something that turned out to be true or, or not true that it was particularly illuminating for you or the executives? Yeah, illuminating for sure, but maybe not, maybe not once I thought about it, like not too surprising. So one of the hypotheses was that this context, not just working from home, but the fact that we work for a pharma company that's arguably, you know, by some measures, one of the biggest vaccines companies uh, in the world. We, so we're, we're working, partnering with other companies on potentially having a, a COVID vaccine. And um, we're working on a kind of a antibody potential treatment too, if you get exposed to it. And the, the, the idea was that, or the hypothesis was that people feel more connected to our purpose as a company. Um, and people feel kind of grateful that they're able to keep working during, during this time. And I think we, uh, we saw really strong evidence of that in, in our survey data we have sections of the survey that that tap into that kind of notion as well as some engagement questions that are about like pride in the company and that sort of thing. Things that focus on 
uh, customers and patients. And all of those measures, even though they're already really high, all of those went up. And then I, I think you said Penny's on the phone. She's She, on our team, worked on our kind of an analysis of the qualitative data. And um, she found a lot of evidence in people's comments, like kind of open-ended comments they made to a write-in question uh, where they um, they also provided evidence that they felt really proud of of the company and what we were doing. Mm -hmm. There were also, I mean, there were some things that um, I wouldn't say we disproved their hypotheses, but we just went, ah, oh, well, we didn't see great evidence of that. Um, and they were things like people uh, being better able to prioritize their work. I mean, that's always been a problem. We're probably not alone in that. There's always, you know, a million important things to do. And um, that that's an area that I didn't really see getting better. Um, so that was kind of like we were able to go back to them with some good news and then some like, well, sorry, we didn't find anything there. So, so let's, let's move to that general topic of how do executives respond to data, um, particularly maybe if, it, if it's a little disconnected from what they might have expected. Um, do any of you have examples of how executives learn, um, especially learn something that maybe they didn't expect from, from data in, through this process? Mike, do you have a, a thought on that one? Yeah, I accidentally clicked away the screen, so I'm back. Um, no, totally. I, I think uh, we have some some pretty good examples there. So with our executives, they're mostly engineering, so they do understand data. They they totally trust the numbers that we present, and they'll have great ideas on how we can look at things in different ways. Actually, the biggest let's pause just for a second there. Engineers believing data, that's good. Engineers believing HR data. I don't think that always happens. So let, let's just have yeah. a little, uh, 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 you know, good for you, whatever you're doing. Uh, Tommy's <laughs> smiling. Yeah. You can probably picture a lot of uh, uh, research scientists that may or may not respond to employee data in that way. So anyway, keep going. I just wanted to pause and say that's something to be celebrated, not assumed. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the team does a great job working with them and earning that credibility uh, and making sure we don't lose it. But but I think the biggest thing that we've learned with them is, you know, in this, this topic, for example, with flexible work and what employees are looking for and what they want, you know, there's a ton of research out there and you can look at benchmarks and, and the type of flexible work employees are looking for. It doesn't really matter what we see out there unless we can confirm it with our own data. So we'll always want to look at things for ourselves. With our survey, we did find pretty similar things. Most of our employees do want to work flexible schedules. Uh, there's skepticism on like, well, certainly not in this group, they won't. And it's like, nope, they do. Uh, so th that's really the biggest thing is just being sure we go with, to them with, you know, clear examples from the pockets or the whole org that they're looking for. And then, yeah, we can cut the data a million ways for them to make sure it answers exactly what they're looking for, but then they'll trust it and they'll advocate it, they'll act on it. Um, so we've had really good luck with that. Yeah, I'm sure it's more than just luck. Um, <laughs> so so you, you did a survey this summer, you said you didn't really have a, a history of survey. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that was received and, and maybe a backdrop about the charter, but then what was the, the sort of executive mindset of looking and feeling it through the data? Sure. Uh, we did an anti-racism survey with Org Vitality because um, we were recognizing that we've sort of hung our hats on this identity of being a company that's founder led. Jenny is a, a white Midwestern female that lives in Columbus, Ohio. I'm the head of HR. I am also a white Midwestern female that lives in Columbus, Ohio. And our CEO is also a white guy. And we um, wanted to be very uh, uh, humble as we should be about not knowing what we don't know and really leaning into not knowing what we don't know. And um, like I said before, if I could have just gotten on a plane and gone all over the place, that would have been great, but we couldn't do that because of COVID. And, 
So here we were thinking, all right, what's the most efficient way we can gather a lot of different perspectives? And so we did an anti-racism survey and um, we, you, would, you were asking how that kind of information is received. And I think our, at Jenny's, we're unique in that um, we talk about making people feel loved today. That's sort of our thing. It's on a sign right there. It's what we do in our scoop shops and it's what we have hanging in every one of our warehouses. It's what we have hanging in our finance department. And we talk about it a lot. We're not, and it's not in a soft sort of passive way. It's just a sort of ferocious um, uh, the desire to help, you know, people need positive experiences. They need to feel like they belong. And so this opportunity, this sort of racial justice reckoning opportunity is one that's very connected to what we exist for. And so we wanted to hear how are our people feeling about their experience as an employee inside the company and then how are they feeling outside of the company. And so it was um, very helpful to gather that input that way. That's good. You know, uh, talk about feeling loved. I think ice cream has a special relationship to that. Um, you, you, the way you describe it, actually, I was thinking about what was the last scene or so of that Pixar movie Up, where they're sitting outside a, a call it a scoop shop. It's actually modeled after Fenton's ice cream, which is probably less than five miles from my house where I'm sitting right now. But it's you know, ice cream memories and ice cream. That's just you know. Tommy, you might have some awesome antidepressants, but I think ice cream's right up there, right up there. Well, I agree. To um, add to that, you know, the purpose <laughs> of it is typically people coming together to experience something joyful together. And COVID meant all of a sudden people could hardly be together and we couldn't serve them ice cream. Everything we hang our hat on got sort of stopped as we knew it. And um, so there were a lot of reasons that we needed to look for new ways to contribute. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about company identities um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty clear, I think, to picture how a pharmaceutical company that's working on vaccines is like participating in today's world. And, and so you just described that. Um, Micah, what can you say about, you know, executive theories and engagement and survey data with regard to how a Qualcomm identity might be expressed these days that, that may be different than last a year ago? Um, I mean, for us, we've changed a lot as a company in the last year and a half, you know, the, the arc of our company has uh, really improved in the last 18 months. So it's been fascinating to see the profile of a Qualcomm employee and, and their pride in, in working for us and our mission and what we're doing and, you know, 5G and everything happening there and the excitement there and especially in this environment with COVID that's become even more important to, to connect everybody and enable services that, that help that. So, yeah, I mean, for us, we, we there, it's not one profile of our employees. It's a very, we're 40,000 employees across the globe. Yeah. So lots of different pockets. That's one of my big takeaways too, with this is just surveys have always required a lot of socialization, but now more than ever, uh, to make sure we're being inclusive and capturing everybody's situation accurately, it's doubled, maybe even more than that, uh, just to make sure, like for our, our COVID related surveys, we wanted to make sure it yep. was convenient and, and applicable to every region or our small percent of employees who are on site critical and they all the question should be applicable to them too. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really looking across wide swaths and seeing what are the themes that bubble up, but then also being able to drill into different pockets. Scott, yeah. Scott I, have a, I have a question for Micah, if, if it's okay. And uh, Micah, you were, your company was doing these quarterly surveys. Uh, so you almost had live access into what was changing during, as people, you know, had to work from home. That was one of the things that um, we didn't have. We had, you know, our survey data from last time, and then we were planning for our survey and did it about two months after everybody started working from home. And one of the things that I worry about is that we saw a big bump in our many of our scores, like in favorability, for example, in our engagement score. And um, part of the thing that I worry about is was that a bump because everybody felt really connected now and really proud of, proud of the company and are we going to see that same thing down the road so I was just curious if you saw anything similar in your data 
Yeah, and I know OV has a lot to share from from all the surveys, and I, I caught a couple of the earlier sessions in this conference on. Uh, we saw extremely high scores out of this, and that sounds like that's more typical than not typical with with um, rally around the flag effect, I think is what you called it, Scott. Um, but yeah, in real time, I mean, it was pretty cool. I, to... Somebody else called it that first. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a bump that maybe is short lived or an opportunity to sustain it, but you have to do something to sustain it. Um, but it's an opportunity for leaders for sure. They're looked at in a very positive light, um, in this environment in particular. You know, just a quick interjection about that. I think each of you talked a little bit about humility and curiosity and, uh, whether it's a engineering or a scientifically led company or, or you know, things like that. And the rally around the flag effect is something that um, was tagged in the 1970s, you know, looking at pre U.S. presidents like Truman and, and different uh, externally driven crises and what it did to uh, presidential approval ratings. There's been some research since then about different kinds of leadership styles. and There's a lot of way to break that up, but there are two. And the way that you all are talking, you seem to be part of the second style. First style is a little bit more of a domineering, authoritative style that comes on strong in a crisis that tries to say this is the way things go and so forth and so on. The second is more of a prestige, they call it prestige-based uh, style, which is a little bit more of a, um, a questioning. It's very consistent with being scientific, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more empathetic and and humble kind of uh, let's sort of solve this together type of thing. And um, some of the research suggests that that might not come on as strong initially with regard to leader approvals. And it's mostly this we're talking world leader approvals, but it might sustain a little better. And um, the uh, authoritative, if they fall, they fall harder uh, in sort of approval ratings. Now that's political leader approval ratings, which is very different than it, it, it's 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 got some resonance, but I, I don't want to uh, equate it to uh, corporate executive, you know, credibility and leadership styles exactly. But but there's a a a parallel there to draw that I think is is interesting because each of you in a different way has has started to sort of describe a little bit more of a prestige based rather than authoritative based uh, kind of style in your own organizations. Um, cool, well, um, let me sort of start to uh, wind down a little bit. When you, you think about how executives talk to the organizations based on data and so forth, are you, um, happy with, proud of, uh, trying to coach executives through how they talk about data back to the organization. Um, you know, so like Tommy, for example, when executives share back to the organization, what do they tend to get right and, and what works well? Yeah, um, have to be careful since this is recorded. <laughs> um, I think they get what they tend to get right is um, focusing on priorities, right? I mean, they know the priorities better than than I do, better than the survey team does, than the, better than the analytics team. And some of the times, like their uh, hypotheses that I mentioned, um, they are surprisingly good and when you know when i first saw these these hypotheses i was like wow is this really going to work in the survey data and then we we're actually able to provide them something that was really helpful but because they asked the questions in a really good way i i think the second part of yours is what they don't get right and um i i see examples sometime where they kind of talk about and a result from the survey, for example, and then talk about the reason why that result was obtained. And that's where I start to cringe a little bit because we, we know less about the validity of, of 
the reasons behind the why. So for example, we had questions in there about um, how much people wanted to work from home going forward once we have a choice about it. And one of our executives talked about that number and how, you know, what the favorability was, how much people wanted to work from home, and then went on to say, and they want to work from home because X and Y and Z. And I was like, whoa, where'd, where'd that come from? Where'd that data come from? So sometimes I worry about that a little bit. Okay. Micah, Zoe, anything you want to share about how executives respond to data and talk about it? Like uh, you want to, or, yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Um, one of the things we found was that in our data set, you would find um, themes that really uh, contrasted one another. You, you should absolutely put a Black Lives Matter sign in every shop window. You should absolutely not put a Black Lives Matter sign in every shop window. You should be open. You should be closed. You should be sampling ice cream. You should not be sampling ice cream. And so with big issues, you would have very strong opinions that um, made it hard sometimes to live like we used to live, which was sort of, I mean, ice cream is a pretty pleasant thing to talk about and it's not that hard to attempt to please a lot of your people at any given moment. And um, so we were sort of stuck with a lot of decisions that meant we were going to make some group pretty unhappy at times if we chose one path or another. And so, I think what our executive team had to think through was how to not let that dynamic of um, of strong opinions that were sort of polar opposites lead us to do nothing and then try to please everyone. And we really had to get back to our values, back to a strong sense of who we are as a company, and then use logic, head, love, heart, good gut instinct, head, heart, gut decision making, and then feel, and then gather data through the surveys and through talking to people and as much video conferencing as we could do so that we could talk to people and then come to a good decision that we could say, this was the right thing to do and we can, we can say why, but not let it hamstring us and do nothing. So that was, I think the um, challenge for us was to not let our executives get, um, Get, get so much data that they didn't know, you know, that paralysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Micah, anything uh, to add? Yeah, I mean, pretty similar. I, I would say uh, more like what you said, Tommy, on occasionally jumping to a conclusion that's maybe not there, taking it a step further than what the data would support. But I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of nitpicking. I, I think they do a great job uh, and I'll take it as long as they're out there preaching and sharing uh, so proactively, you know, they start our company all hands meetings with survey findings and what they're doing about it. Um, and our prep sessions will ask to add more slides than even the ones we recommend putting in their deck, which is just, it's great to have that level of engagement. And if it comes with maybe <laughs> making one claim too many, it, it, as long as they're sharing the bulk of what we want to get out there, it's, it seemed to be working pretty well. But I think that that is a moment every time where it's like, oh, that's not exactly the talking point. Yeah, at least they're talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, let's start to wind down and, and maybe last question for you each. Um, if given your experiences with surveys and trying to connect with executives and sort of address their hypotheses and values and respond to people and everything we've been just talking about, if you had a few pieces of advice for the audience today, um, wh what would it be? Um, so, Micah, you were just Micah. talking, you wanna start? Sure, um, yeah, so for me, you know, if you recall from the opening slide, we really didn't need to adapt our program too terribly much. You know, we did one extra survey, we surveyed the whole company instead of a sample in a couple cases, but we left the program intact largely. And I, I think that's my biggest thing is, helping to frequently re-educate executives and help them understand that their needs can fit into our existing programs and we don't need to you know, spin off separate efforts or reinvent the wheel every time. And really just one well-constructed survey can accomplish so many different things and answer so many questions. If you design the items and the analyses really thoughtfully anticipate what leaders are gonna ask or need to know, um, that's just been the best thing for us to, to prevent 
just so many separate surveys and survey fatigue. We try to really have everything, get, get the biggest bang for our buck out of each effort we're, we're putting out there. Mm -hmm. So it kind of sounds like, it, the, like you're saying, a well-constructed survey um, can be agile enough to adapt to a pandemic or racial injustice or whatever comes exactly. next. Yep, absolutely. Uh, wildfires, you know, unbreathable air. Um, <laughs> What's next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, all right, uh, Tommy. Piece well, of advice. yeah, I guess um, I'm a little bit envious of so how how connected you are able to be with your executive team because i think my piece of advice would be the closer that you can stay to what the executive team, whoever your like real stakeholders are your real decision makers the closer that you can stay to what they're thinking and what their questions are, the better job you can do in terms of both designing your survey, like like you're saying, Micah, and being prepared to pivot if you need to, but also in planning, you know, analyses and insights that come from the survey in a way that that really meet their needs and and scratch all the right itches. And it's harder, like with a giant giant global organization, it's already a little difficult. Yeah. And then when we're all working from home, it's even harder. Yeah, yeah. How many time zones away are some of your key stakeholders? Yeah, it's typically about five hours. Yeah, all right. Uh, and now, uh, Zoe, that cleanup, bring us home. I, as, as I think about any advice, I guess it's something, Scott, you. Uh, used to talk to me about this 20 years ago when we were first working on our you know, very first survey project. It's like the survey itself as an intervention. And I realized that again, with the way we've been surveying this year, meaning we didn't have a track record of doing them. And then so all of a sudden we started doing them. And by the questions we asked that in itself told every employee that participated in the survey what we care about and what we're curious about and what we want their opinion about and that by communicating that by them participating in the survey and knowing, oh you care about this you care about my opinion about this you're willing to do something about this um i don't i don't think everybody knows that the survey itself is an intervention i think oftentimes people think well whatever results we get back will determine the intervention but you've already started changing things once you decide what the design is and but once you send it out and people start to read uh, and think through what you care about so um, to me it's just helpful to think about the process starting then and the change starting then and the influencing starting then nice nice well said well i i think that's great and and i think you know i'm struck by how similar to everything that you just said was, was about, you know, the well-constructed survey, the, you know, the items themselves do something, you know, staying connected to the hypotheses and questions of people. Even though you each come from really different structures with inside really different organizations. Um, so maybe that means we're converging on truth. <laughs> uh, it's kind of lofty to end on, but, um, uh, I want to thank each of you. I think this was was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I'm certain the audience got a lot out of each of the things that you guys said. Um, and again, I would encourage anybody who can to hang on and then we can uh, be a little less formal and, and sort of go on video and, and have more general chats amongst all of us. But I want to draw this session now formally to a close because I know some people will have other things to run off to. But um, um, so stay if you can, but otherwise, you know, have a great weekend and, and this, you know, will um, close out the formal session of this conference. So uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, all three of you. Uh, this was great. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I regret that I'm Pleasure. one of the ones that has to hop off. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Tommy. <laughs>